Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. I'm your new co-host, Brian Watson, known as Anal Pornography on Reddit, flared in the history of pornography and obscenity. You may remember me from a couple of episodes back. I'm very excited today to be giving you part one of an interview with W.A. Ritter, as the research he does is just absolutely fascinating. Today's episode will focus on a very understudied history of the armoring industry in Europe from 1300s to 1600. It will mostly focus on just how armor was made, prepared, and assembled. And part two in a couple weeks will bring you the history of the people and the guilds that made the armor and what led to the decline and fall of the armoring industry. While this is a subsection of military history, too much of military history is focused on the most clever weapons or military tactics and not how people survived or sought to protect themselves from those pointy ends. Today, we hope to correct that loss. And just a brief note on the sound volume for today's episode. It will start out as a normal volume, and then it will get quiet for about 10 or 15 minutes. There was a brief recording issue, but then around the 16-minute mark, it will go back up to normal volume again. So if you turn your phone down or up, just make sure you correct it right before it switches back over. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hi, W.A. Ritter. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So let's start with the basics of your background. What, what got you interested in this? Where, where are you coming from with arms and armor? I think that just about everyone uh, that's interested in arms and armor would say that they've been interested in it since uh, maybe the ages of five to seven. As soon as I learned what a knight was, I was just fascinated by them. I was fascinated. I mean, I guess some of it was the romance, but I was always just interested in the armor. It's what distinguishes them from other warriors with noble codes. It's what did, uh, makes them such a distinctive figure, the knight in shining armor. So, you know, some other scholars have a dramatic story about going to the Met, watching a movie. But for me, I think it was just picking up books when I was a kid. And I was just, I was fascinated by the subject. Uh, I had some pretty good kids' books on the subject. Uh, there's one called The World of the Medieval Knight by Christopher Gravett, uh, who's actually a Royal Armouries guy. who's done a lot of uh, kids in popular histories about knights. Uh, and that kind of sucked. And I've, uh, if you count being a kid, of course, I've been reading about this for well over 20 years at this point. But I'd say I've been seriously studying it for the past 10 years or so. I definitely, I love that image of the knight in the shining armor. It's something I think we think about a lot, but don't actually like think about the actual armor and how it got on him. From what I know of like medieval and early modern Europe from my broad expertise in video games and fantasy novels, it was clearly the local blacksmith that made these things, right? Along with the pointy sword you might buy. You might go and give them five gold pieces for a nice new plate of armor. Well, that's a common misconception that a lot of people have. And I think part of that... There's a lot of misconceptions that are piled on top of each other there. Part of it is a misunderstanding of the medieval world. There's this kind of idealized image of the feudal world and the manor mm -hmm. as a self-sufficient thing, which may be somewhat true, kind of not really, for the peasantry, for your villains, serfs, tenant farmers, whatever their title is. But, you know, even into the beginnings of a lot of what we recognize as the Middle Ages, the world of knights, as soon as they become a force, in, you know, especially a separate class as into the 11th century, you start seeing towns grow up and then cities after that. And so the medieval economy becomes rather sophisticated rather quickly in a lot of ways. And so by the 13th century uh, or even 12th century, you see records of people who were specialized makers of armor. And this ties together with a greater and greater degree of uh, specialization in the economy as a, as a whole, where, you know, people are just doing very particular jobs. And if anything, things only become more specialized as time goes on. As we get into... The later Middle Ages, which when we're talking about knights and shining armor, we're really talking about the later Middle Ages and into the early modern period. By that period, we're talking about very specialized makers of armor specifically, the swordsmiths for something else. Your local blacksmith was repairing plows or hoes or basic tools or uh, you know, sometimes making nails if there wasn't a nail manufacturer nearby, you know, that kind of basic uh, blacksmith 
where uh, and they were selling the blacksmiths were selling largely to farmers uh people with fairly simple needs collaborate with other craftsmen uh, but when we look at armorers their clients are something entirely different their clients are uh the great lords their clients are cities and their clients are kings and not always directly uh, often there's intermediaries but we can get back to get to that uh in a bit so, wow, so like um, the blacksmiths are sort of like the very first industrialized business in a sense, and the armors are really focusing on an individualized business, right? Yeah, and it's a really, uh, I mean, I think uh, that's something that we can, uh, it's something that differs so much between different uh, cities and armor, and product, armor production centers. Mass production is perhaps a, an anachronistic term, but you do see very large numbers of armors created very early. There's a man named, if I recall his name, uh, Peter the Lombard, which means that he's from Northern Italy, probably mm-hmm. Milan. And he's a merchant at the end of the 13th century. And he is selling to the King of France armors by the thousands. He's selling shields by the thousands. He's wow. selling hauberks by the thousands. He's selling helmets by the thousands. Now, like, importantly for this story, pieces of plate armor by the thousands already. Uh, and many of those were probably made in Milan. Uh, that he may have had some family connections, uh, and we can get into that when we talk about Milan specifically. Well, so what specifically is plate plate armor? That's like what the term you use. What what is it, and like how did it come around into being? Well, I think I mean plate armor is it's the iconic armor. It's the knight in shining armor. It is what people call a suit of armor today. Historically, it was generally referred to as a harness. Everything that someone wears from head to toe, and it developed relatively gradually beginning in the 13th century with uh, fairly simple torso defenses, several smaller plates of metal that would be riveted to uh, stiff cloth backing like canvas. And in the 14th century, that develops much more fully until you have people that are covered from head to toe almost in metal plates by the first quarter of the 15th century. And the armorers really develop alongside this. The first armorer's guilds, or what becomes armorer's guilds, are often the uh, helm makers, or as they're called in English, the humors, H-E-A-U-M-E-R-S. They're the makers of helmets, which before plate armor was the metal plate defense that people would be wearing. And over time, this develops into some of these same guilds in some cases become by the 15th century the plate armorers guild or in the case of of london they become a company of armorers of london in other cases you see these plate armorers develop in parallel with the makers of helms and generally the helm makers will pass out of existence as they get replaced uh, or incorporated into this larger industry of making plate armor So to get back to your question, just to answer it simply rather than uh, in a very complicated fashion, plate armor is the rigid body defense of metal plates that's worn in the later Middle Ages and the early modern period Mm -hmm. in Europe. Um, And the people that make it uh, are the people that I will refer to here as armorers. In in German, they would have been referred to as harness makers or plattners. Uh, and there's a variety of other terms, but uh, we'll, we'll just call them arm. And another thing to remember is that they're distinct from the mail makers, because those are two very different skills. You know, putting together all those little iron links versus creating, pounding out a sheet of metal and then putting it together, very different processes and very different skills. So these armors would buy specifically, like, would buy specifically plates of metal that they would shape? Uh, that is uh, actually how it worked. I think sometimes people have the image of medieval smiths, including armors, working from ore. But in many cases, uh, we know that they were at least buying raw iron and steel. And we also know that in many cases, so not raw, but uh, refined iron and steel, often they were buying this in the form of plates. But I think just for some background, we should go into how iron and steel are made, which affects how armor is made fall of the Roman Empire. Iron and steel were made in only one way, which was through the bloomery. Iron has a very high melting point, and so unlike bronze, unlike tin, unlike gold, unlike silver, when you refine iron from ore, 
a lot of the time it never actually melts. It becomes kind of spongy. Different uh, substances will kind of clump together and you can kind of knock off uh, the bits that you don't want. But this sort of iron making never melts the metal. And so it produces kind of this small batch of iron or steel, depending upon the conditions of your furnace, that forms this kind of hump that is referred to as a blue. Mm -hmm. And this type of furnace is referred to as a bloomer. Now, the other way of doing it, which we see in China very early, uh, and which we see in Europe beginning in the people call the High Middle Ages, uh, and it spreads more and more. What we see later is uh, another process, which we now call a blast furnace. And confusingly, often the same furnace, if it's big enough, could be a bloomery if you wanted it to be, or a blast furnace. And they have different advantages and disadvantages. So the the blast furnace runs hot enough and is big enough that it melts the iron ore and it melts out the iron. But the problem with this process is that it produces uh, iron that is too high in carbon content, which mm -hmm. people call cast iron or pig iron. And this is um, it's too brittle. It has way too much carbon. Uh, all steel is a combination of iron and carbon. But if you have too much of that, then what you have is something that's more crystalline, uh, that's more like a, a rock or even like glass, rather than like this nice, kind of bendable, very tough metal. And so what you actually need to do, after you've made cast iron in a blast furnace, you need to make take it through another process called fining, where you heat it all back up, you have this like big cake of cast iron that came out, you pour it out of your blast furnace, you heat it back up, and you basically recook it and melt it a little bit until it's semi-molten, until you basically burn off the extra carbon that's built up in it, and that will uh, produce uh, usable iron or steel. But and we'll get into the implications of this for armorers later, uh, it's actually very hard to control this process. It's very hard to hit the sweet spot of medium carbon steel, which is steel that is just has enough carbon to make it strong and to let you heat treat it, uh, which we'll get into later too, uh, but doesn't have too much carbon to make it brittle. Uh, and so a lot of the time after this fining process, the we just burn out all the carbon of this iron and you would be left with uh, just wrought iron. It would just be pure iron, which is actually a very weak material. It's weaker than bronze and it can't be improved by working it or hardening it. You're basically stuck with what you have. Um, and that's something that has a lot of implications for armors. Like you, like you said, it comes out very rough and um, not quite treated right it wouldn't have been decorated what what was the next step after you had after it came right out of the furnace oh right so the next step is that so after uh you create iron or steel uh the next step would be to hammer it out into a plate now it's possible that sometimes armorers were working directly from an ingot or even a bloom that they bought but in many cases we have good evidence for hammering mills existing in europe there is uh some in nuremberg uh, there's some in near Milan. Uh, there's a variety of other ones that are attested throughout Europe. Uh, and often they were owned by armorers or associated with armorers. And these hammering mills flattened out ingots of iron into sheets or plates. And in many cases, this was the, uh, the raw material. And I guess I should go into a little bit more detail about how these work. Your only real alternative to manpower or animal plant power in the Middle Ages was water power. And so these hammering mills would have a water wheel mm -hmm. uh, that would be attached to a series of gears that would have these kind of cogs that would have almost like a, you can picture like a ratchet that will allow hammers to sometimes drop whenever the ratchet passes by them and these hammers will fall. and pound out whatever is under it, and then they'll get picked up by the water wheel pick up again and then fall again uh, and these uh, trip hammers as they're called are used in a variety of medieval industries including uh, fulling cloth which um, makes it fuzzy makes mm -hmm. one cloth fuzzy 
Uh, they're also used in paper making. So there are there different levels of finish on the armor? Like, could you buy your basic Honda Civic breastplate and then at some other price point there are Maseratis and Ferraris of decoration, so to speak? What, what was the Lamborghini of armor? Oh, well, that's a really good question. I think um, whenever we talk about armor, we, we should talk about really three, because it's an easy way to think of it, I think about it in three different le- levels of quality. Uh, the first is munition armor, which is armor that is made for common infantrymen. Uh, it is often semi-mass produced or, you know, you can just drop a semi off of it by the 16th century. Uh, and it's often being bought in very large quantities by great lords or by cities that have town militias or by the king. Uh, or sometimes it may be bought by individual people who, uh, you know, were required for their militia service with their city to, uh, to own armor, so they bought it. And generally these are simple armors and they're not complete armors. They uh, don't include all the pieces because they're made for infantrymen or light cavalrymen, uh, cavalrymen. So they don't have leg armor, uh, they don't have a full helmet. In, by the 16th century, what is, it's generally something referred to as a corselet, which is uh, armor for the outside of your arms, armor for the shoulder, armor for the upper chest and neck, a helmet, and then a breast and back plate. Sometimes you get armor for the upper thighs as well, as part of that uh, kind of ensemble. That way of making armor actually takes out all the fiddly bits, and it's very adaptable, and you don't have to worry about fitting leg length uh, and uh, tricky things like that uh, as much. And there's a variety of shortcuts used in these armors. Uh, Many of them were left rough from the hammer. They just weren't polished at all, so they just were left with their mill scale on, uh, just that blackened look. Uh, like you sometimes get stuff if you've been to a Ren fair and gotten something from a blacksmith and how everything's blackened. Uh, that's uh, kind of the look that a lot of this stuff had. You would still have that kind of rough hammer finish. Then slightly higher up, you have the, the mid-range of armor. This is really the bread and butter of armorers in the later part of the 15th century into the 16th century. These are full armors that are often semi-mass produced. They're not individually made for an individual customer. They'll be made uh, to, you know, general sizes and then sold. And sometimes sold in tremendous numbers. In one case, Edward IV of England bought 100 full armors Mm -hmm. from a prominent armoring and merchant family in Milan called the Missaglia. And he bought them 100, and the price was relatively low. averages out some of these orders, uh, not this particular one, average out to, in English money, around two or three pounds per armor, uh, which is quite a bit of money uh, in terms of soldiers' wages, several months' salary. And that's cheap compared with the high end of armor, which really, when we talk about that, uh, that sort of armor, the sky's the limit for its extravagance. These are the pieces that are displayed in museums today as their centerpieces. These are often, uh, by the later 15th century, they are gilded. By the 16th century, they're etched. Sometimes they're decorated in various extravagant ways with different techniques like damascening, where you beat gold wire into the metal and then polish the surface. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or they could be decorated with fire gilding, where you paint the surface with a paste of gold dust and mercury and then burn everything off. Uh, So these armors, these are the armors that range from the armors of great lords, some of which would be fairly simple looking, but would be made custom for that wearer. And then on the other, the very high end is the armor of, of emperors and kings. And that is its own strange beast because it has its own economies. By the time that you put that much gold on armor, the biggest part of the cost of armor actually becomes Uh, the gold that you're putting into it. Uh, This is a contrast to lower end armors where unlike some other products of the medieval economy, a mid-range armor, most of the cost of it was the labor. The actual raw materials, the steel itself, was uh, 15% of the cost compared to the cost of paying your work. Uh, And that's a little bit unusual for the Middle Ages where generally, uh, you know, if you could generalize the story of medieval economics is cheap, uh, cheap labor and expensive raw materials. Uh, this is a case of 
the labor being much more expensive than the raw materials. And in that way, it's like fine sculpture or, uh, or art, where, you know, the cost of a painting isn't the cost of your pigments, so that's part of it, but it's primarily uh, the price of the artist itself. So those are the kinds of, um, I guess, suits of armor that you'd see in the museum constantly and not so much the beaten up old armor of an infantryman. Exactly. The one thing to remember about even the highest end armor is you really have to look at it very carefully before you decide that it's just for show. I think that's a, a misconception people have about a lot of these armors is that because something is utterly covered in gold and etching, that it isn't for war. When in fact, part of being a great lord or a great king or a great emperor uh, in the Middle Ages and early modern period was showing your wealth and your power. Absolutely would wear an etched and gilt armor onto the field of battle because you needed to declare yourself as someone that was worth following. And that means, among other things, that you were wealthy, that you could you know, give extravagantly to your men. Uh, and often, uh, just as kind of a by the way, one of those ways that lords showed their extravagance is by giving gifts of armor to their retainers. Uh, sometimes almost as a de facto part of their salary is they would be <laughs> equipped with armor by their, uh, their lords. One of the things I, I hear about um, when it comes to blacksmithing and I guess metalworking in general is um, heat treatment. What, what, what was heat treatment? Were there like particular advantages to it? Yeah, I mentioned that a bit earlier. Um, so, you know, if we picture the process of making armor, you, you have your raw sheet of steel, and then your next step is to, to shape it into armor. And this is done through a workshop, multiple people working together. In some cases, you have specialists that make one particular type of armor, uh, and you generally at least have a master and some journeyman and apprentices working under him. And we, when we talk about guilds, we can talk about how all that works socially and they work together to shape the armor uh the next steps are the finish and the treatment of the armor and the finish uh will generally involve uh, a polish which gets into the uh the level of fanciness of the armor that we were discussing before uh you know the very rough armors of common infantrymen may not even be polished but another part of it would be heat treating it and this is a critical part of what makes armor more or less protective a scholar by the name of Alan Williams has done an exhaustive amount of research on the heat treatment of armor based on using uh, x-rays and microscopic imaging to find out what the structure on a microscopic level is of the steel. And what he's found out is that in many cases, medieval armor was heat treated. And the way that this works is armorers would heat up steel, the, the armor once it had been shaped, and then they would plunge it into uh, either a hot liquid like molten, like hot brine or hot water, or uh, in some cases there's references to molten lead, um, which is still <laughs> a good deal cooler than uh, glowing red hot steel. And that's called a slack quench. Uh, and that produces a variety of structures in the metal with names like uh, bainite and perlite. But this produces an armor that's medium hard right off the bat. Uh, and the way it does this is when you heat up uh, steel that's at least of a medium carbon content and then cool it down, it changes that microscopic structure of the way that the iron and the carbon is organized in the metal. And it changes that structure into different crystalline patterns. And that changes the mechanical properties of the steel. When you heat treat by a slack quench, you get something that's medium hard. But the great thing about it is you don't have to do anything else. The other way of doing it, and you often see this in movies, though not done quite right, is a full quench where you take glowing iron or, or steel, I should say, and just plunge it into cold water. And, you know, the steam will billow out and just kind of explode <laughs> everywhere. Now, that's tricky to do even with a sword because there's a risk of it breaking. And with armor, uh, based on what we know, they actually had to build sometimes like uh, kind of frameworks to make sure that the armor didn't warp or crack. But anyway, you would plunge it in and then you would take it out once it had cooled. And that produces incredibly hard steel. 
But the trick is, it's actually too hard. Uh, what you then need to do is you need to reheat it and you need to um, cool it down then slowly. So you reheat it to fraction of its original temperature and then let it cool in the air. And this process, which people today call tempering, produces a, a, a steel, if you do everything exactly right, that is very hard, very tough, and even a bit springy. Uh, this is how you get, you know, those sword blades that have a bit of flex to them. And it's also how you get very tough armor. And an interesting thing about these processes is that when Williams looked at different armors, uh, he found that the Italian armors were using a slack quench up until about 1500, when they stopped using quenching at all uh, and stop heat treating their armor. And then the Germans and later the English in the Greenwich Armory were using a full quench. And this means that German and Italian armor, armors actually have a very different metallurgical profile. Now, unfortunately, uh, Williams wasn't able to look at that many armors from places other than Germany or Italy, like English armors or armors from the Low Countries. Or from... He wasn't able to find many of those that were heat treated. But in all honesty, I think his sample size was too so small that I'm not sure how much of a conclusion we can draw from that. And just in a in a practical sense, what would that do when you were on the battlefield trying to defend against, I don't know, a sword or, I guess, muskets later on? Well, what heat-treated armor does is it makes, it makes armor tremendously more protective at no additional weight. Because the armor is hard while still being bendable and tough, it is tremendously protective. And what we see with heat-treated armor is that uh, it really gives an edge to people that are able to afford it. And often it is those high-end armors that are heat treated, but not always. Uh, there's some cases where we see armors for common infantrymen that are still heat treated. I did a kind of, I looked at a lot of Williams raw data and I looked only at infantry breastplates. And I saw that about half of the infantry breastplates that are from a time and a place where we know that the armorers were heat treating their armor, about half of those breastplates were heat treated. So it's definitely something that people did if they could. Uh, and depending upon who was making the armor, it's something that was part of its quality and part of its reputation. And this gets into something that's very important in the overall armor industry, which is the reputation of individual centers of armor, mm -hmm. uh, that different cities would have reputations for fine armor. Uh, there's a few cities in Germany that essentially always produced heat-treated armor of the best metallurgical quality. Uh, and these were famous in their own day, uh, and their pieces are very well represented in museums. I guess the armorers that heat-treated or made higher-quality armor always had return customers because they actually survived to return to the customer. <laughs> well, that's one way of looking at it. I think in a lot of cases, uh, you know, the armor might get used and no one would get shot or stabbed, and so it'd sit on a peg until the next war ran around. But it <laughs> created a reputation for quality among those places that could maintain it. And that's very important to how the guilds eventually see themselves and what they do is try to maintain that level of quality. But I guess, you know, going back to these levels of quality of armor, if you were an emperor that bought armor, you would expect it to be excellently protective. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't up to those standards, if you tested it by, for instance, shooting your own breastplate, uh, <laughs> as Emperor Maximilian II did, you would, uh, you might look somewhere else. <laughs> I, actually, that, I was thinking you were just joking there, but it's impressive that he actually shot his own breastplate. He wasn't wearing it because, of course, if he trusted it enough, he wouldn't have to test it. Uh, he actually shifts from patronizing the Nuremberg armorer Kunz Lochner, who did not heat treat his armor, to some armorers from Innsbruck and from Landshut, which did. Now, I mentioned testing armor, and that's something else I should probably mention, is you do, sometimes you see uh, in museums, armors that have what look like bullet dents in their breastplates, and those are exactly what those are. We have evidence from the 14th century onward that armorers were regulatory authorities or customers were testing armor by shooting it, uh, first with crossbows and then with guns. Typically, it was done either by the armorer or by the regulatory board, if you want to call that, use that <laughs> anachronistic term. 
uh, the guild or civic oversight that the craft of the armorers had set up. Uh, they would test it, and then at the end, they might mark it in some cities uh, to say that passed the test. Other times, they would mark armor just after a visual inspection. As you can guess, just looking at armor and saying, yeah, this seems legit, isn't quite up to, to snuff compared to just shooting a breastplate with a gun. And so you see some particular customers, like Emperor Maximilian II, shot armor that they purchased just to see how well it worked. Uh, in one case in Elizabethan England, a gentleman bought two breastplates, shot one and shot the other and compared the results. <laughs> kind of an That's one way of quality testing because they didn't have consumer reports back in those times. Yeah, and it's not unlike, I mean, the modern term for it would be destructive testing. You know, it's something that people still do today is they use an item and then they see if it, if it stands up to that use. And this process, by the way, called proofing, is where we get the term bulletproof today. Uh, oh. They wouldn't have said bulletproof. They said it would have been proof against an arquebus or a pistol or a musket or whatever they were shooting at. Sometimes they would say foolproof or denny proof in an earlier period. Uh, but there were definitely these gradations of protective qualities whenever they're testing their armor. So let's just zoom out for a second, focus on the whole assembly together. You, so you have all these pieces of armor, say a breastplate, shin guards, arm stuff, helmets. So did well, you... As we say, if I may interrupt, just to like talk about the terminology here, um, uh, the shin guards are called greaves. Leg armor is called a cuisse. The armor for the upper thigh, which hangs down from the torso armor, is called a tacit. Uh, the little skirt in the front of that hangs down from the breastplate proper is called the fald. Then the back, the one that hangs down from the back plate, is called the coulette. The armor for the shoulders is uh, pauldrons or spalders, depending upon how, what it looks like. Uh, and then your arm armor is uh, the vambrace, uh, though there's different terms in different periods for that. Uh, your armor for your hands are your gauntlets. Uh, and then your helmet is your helmet, but there's many different names for many different types. Oh, and last but not least, the armor for your feet are your sabatons. Were these all just shipped in a box to the customer or were they, like in the case of the high-end armor, were they just shipped in a box and somebody else would assemble it or was it put together and then shipped to the customer? It would be, uh, some of them would be assembled. So I think that's the last thing that you do, even after heat treatment and even after you decorate it. If you want to fire gild it, if you want to blue it, if you want to do any other treatment to the surface, you do that and then you put the armor together. And some art pieces are always attached to each other. Uh, they're either riveted to leather straps or they're riveted directly to each other. In some places, the person assembling this armor would be have a, would be a specialized armorer called, uh, in Milan, it would be a traversateur, I believe is the term, a traversator. But other pieces, you know, not everything gets riveted to each other. Uh, so often armor would be shipped in, there's references to locked barrels, at least for the storage of armor. It may well have been shipped that way. Uh, there's also these kind of crates or cabinets that armor is stored in, and it may have been shipped like that as well. But when you're talking about shipping things in the Middle Ages, uh, you can't go too wrong with guessing that there was some sort of barrel in so now we've talked about how armor was made. Let's, let's get to the actual people who made it. How are they organized? Are there um, different corporations or guilds that you've been saying? And that's where we're going to leave it off for today, ending right on a cliffhanger. So be sure you tune back in for next week's episode. We will focus on the people, the guilds that made this armor, and how the armoring industry declined and then eventually fell. Thank you for joining us this time on the Ask Historians podcast. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over 100 historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at askhistorians and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com. Thank you very much for listening. And join us next time on the Ask Historians Podcast.